Okay, so the um, Jyotsna has asked me to give some informal lectures on uh, analytic number theory by way of introduction for self-study. Now, I've written this book, <coughs> Problems in Analytic Number Theory, so that students such as yourselves could study on your own. Um, <coughs> and I would recommend that you do that. Um, I think you can probably, there are some creative method, methods of getting hold of the book, which I will not spell out because this is being videotaped. <laughs> now, um, let's see, what can we say? Uh, firstly, analytic, no let me say a few words about analytic number theory. Um, generally, analytic number theory is to use analysis to study uh, problems in number theory. So, it uses analysis to study <coughs> questions <coughs> in number theory. Now, what kind of analysis? Uh, it can be real analysis. It can be complex analysis. Or it could be p-adic analysis. So it could be any one of these uh, types of analysis. Um, <coughs> p-adic is a, a recent entry into the methodology in analytic number theory and I have a book on um, uh, p-adic analytic number theory but if you're interested in studying that you can do that independently of, of both these things. But in this um, kind of informal talk we will um, focus only on real and later on perhaps complex analysis. Hmm? Okay. <coughs> now generally speaking um, we uh, will look at um, methods rather than theorems. So we'll pay attention to um, methods rather than results. Okay, so this is a just a definition of, working definition of what analytic number theory is. Now, <coughs> the focus of study in number theory are arithmetical functions. Arithmetical functions are, by definition, functions, complex valued functions defined on the natural numbers. Hmm? Those are arithmetical functions. And <coughs> generally speaking, we would be interested in interested in a variety of questions. Um, growth of these functions, growth of f at n as n varies, sometimes we may be interested in uh, finding out the behavior of these partial sums and try and understand these sums, um, asymptotics for such for such functions. And so that's basically the, the, the uh, focus of study. Uh, in the class of arithmetical functions, of course, uh, there are 
several types of functions. Uh, the most common, perhaps, that we will be looking at uh, are multiplicative functions. <coughs> and these functions are, if I have, if, the, if they have the property that f of m n equals f of m times f of n, whenever m and n are relatively prime, we say the function is multiplicative. Okay? We say the function is completely multiplicative if f of m n <coughs> is equal to f of n times f of m for all m n, whether, whether, whether they are co-prime or not, it doesn't matter. Hmm? So we, those, those things are completely multiplicative functions. We say a function is an additive function additive <coughs> if we say uh, if f of m n is equal to f of m plus f of n uh, whenever m and n are relatively prime. <coughs> And we say something is completely additive if we remove that restriction. F of m n is f of m <coughs> plus f of n for all m n. Okay, so these are several categories of functions. Let's have a look at some examples. Um, is there an eraser um, here or? Okay. Oh, there is? Here? Is there an eraser here? Let's see. Oh, yeah, there is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Let's look at some examples. Um, the divisor function. So <coughs> D of n is the number of divisors of n. <coughs> okay. So for example, d of 2 is 1 and 2, 2 divisors, right? d of 2 is 2, d of 3 is also 2, d of 5 is 2. Um, d of 6, though, is? 1, 2, 3, and 6, so 4, right? It's 4, um, etc. So this is the divisor function. So clearly, if I was given a number, now you know that every number, every natural number can be written as a product of prime powers uniquely, unique factorization theorem, unique factorization. So you can see that any divisor, any divisor delta of n will then have to look like p1 to the beta 1, pk to the beta k, right? With these beta i's less than alpha i, right? Zero less than beta i less than alpha i. <coughs> any divisor looks like this. Conversely, if I pick any such number with this restriction, it'll be a divisor. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between divisors of n and all numbers of this type. Therefore, how many choices of beta i do I have? Say it loudly. 
alpha i plus 1, exactly. So there are alpha i plus 1 choices for each of them. Therefore, we have an exact formula for d of n. Right? That's the, that's the number of divisors. So the question uh, is, is this a multiplicative function, a completely multiplicative function, an additive function, or a completely additive function, or none of them? What kind of a function is it? Any guesses? It clearly depends only on the factorization. And if m and n are relatively prime, the divisors of m times n can be obtained by taking a divisor of m and a divisor of n and then clumping them together. There they seem to be independent, right? Therefore, it's multiplicative. So this is a multiplicative function, d of m is a multiplicative function. Question is, is it a completely multiplicative function? Is it completely multiplicative? All you, do, all you need to do is you have to come up with an example, correct? OK. Well, let's look at um, d of um, 8. How many divisors does 8 have? That's 2 cubed, right? So 4. But this is not equal to d of cubed, right? So all you need to do is come up with an example to show that it's not the case. So it's not completely right. Actually, we could have taken d of four also. <laughs> d of four is d of four is what three, right? And it's not uh, certainly deep. okay. So it's not completely multiplicative. It's a multiplicative function. And so this is our first example of an arithmetical function. Hmm? We may want to study several things. So here's a so this is what number theorists do. Once you give me an arithmetical function, you try to study this function now from many many different angles. And one of them is how does how fast does this grow? What is the growth rate? of d of n. <coughs> we'll kind of try and, try and figure out how fast is it growing. Um, second is um, things like uh, how does the sum d of n behave, n less than x? Do we have any asymptotic behavior of these partial sums, uh, these partial sums of the divisor functions, uh, that gives us some sort of uh, also some other information on how the thing is growing as a function. And sometimes we can be more in innovative and perhaps study what are called moments and take powers of the divisor function and try and study moments, so called moments of the divisor function. This kind of stuff is, gets harder and harder. It sounds very easy to formulate, but it actually leads to some very interesting stuff. Very, very interesting stuff. And the story is not over yet, and I'll explain that in a second. So this is one good example of an arithmetical function. Oops. So what do you do when things like that happen? Do you just, uh, I guess you'll edit the film, right, for all these bloopers, what they're called, right? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so this is one example of a device. So let me give you another example. Um, 
the Euler phi function, which you probably So 5n is the number of j's less than n, which are relatively prime to n, correct? That's the Euler phi function. And the um, question is, is this a multiplicative function or not? And um, so is this multiplicative? So well, you um, <coughs> have to ask this question and answer this question. By you can answer this question easily by um, trying to first find a formula for five n. Hmm? So here's a simple way of finding a formula for five n. So here I have all the numbers one, two, three, dot dot dot, up to n. Okay, all the numbers. I'm going to determine the probability that a random element between 1 and n is co-prime to n. Okay, I'm going to do that. So how many elements are co-prime to n from 1 to n by my definition? 5n. So the probability that a random number j less than n is co-prime to n is the number of such numbers divided by n, right? It's 5n over n. So that's the probability. On the other hand, <coughs> what does it mean to say some number is co-prime to n? It means it's not divisible by any prime dividing n. Okay, what's the probability that a random number is divisible by a prime p? 1 over p, right? That's the probability. And you want it to be not divisible by p, so it's 1 minus 1 over p. And you want this to happen for every prime dividing n. You don't want it to. So each factor here represents the probability that a random number is not divisible by p. And you want this to happen for every prime dividing n. Therefore, the two probabilities must be the same. Okay, so this gives us a formula for 5n very quickly, right? And we see that phi of any prime power, p, p is a prime, okay, p is a prime. If I take phi of p to the j, I see immediately it's 5p to the j divided by p to the j is equal to 1 minus 1 over p. So I immediately see that it's p to the j, p minus 1. Hmm? Oh, j minus 1, sorry, j minus 1. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> right? p to the j minus 1, p minus 1. That's what you get. So now the question is, is this function a multiplicative function? Yeah, it's, it's clear from here, right? It only depends on the... Uh, prime factorization, and they're independent. So this is, is, multi is multiplicative. And I'll leave it to you to check that it's not completely multiplicative, okay? It is not completely multiplicative. That's easy to check because 5p squared is p times p minus 1. And it's not equal to 5p which is p minus 1 squared. So this is a multiplicative function, but not completely multiplicative. So we seem to be meeting a lot of nice multiplicative functions, but not completely multiplicative functions. All right. <coughs> this is a very useful function to study. It appears all over the place in mathematics, not just number theory. And I, I'm sure that most of you know the famous Euler's theorem. If uh, A and N are relatively prime, then A to the power of 5N is always congruent to 1 mod N, right? I mean, you must have seen this theorem somewhere sometime in life. 
and uh, it's very useful to uh, know that fact. Uh, okay, let's take uh, a third example. Um, let's count the number of prime factors of n. Prime divisors of n. Okay, number of prime divisors of n. So, for example, omega of 6 is 2 because it's divisible by 2 primes. Hmm? Omega of 12 <coughs> is also 2 because it's only divisible by 2 primes, etc., etc. Omega of any prime power is just 1, hmm? p prime. So um, I think it's pretty clear that if m and n are relatively prime, the number of prime factors of m n is equal to the number of prime factors of m plus the number of prime factors of n, right? So this is an additive function. And <clears throat> the question is, is it completely additive? Answer? Is it completely additive? No. Why? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. P, P times P squared. Omega of p squared is only 1, but omega of p plus omega of p is 2, right? Yeah. No. Okay, so it's an additive function, but not completely additive. And again, here one would like to know study how the function omega of n behaves n less than x and see how it's growing and more generally we would like to take powers of the function and study what are called moments. These are all things called moments. Hmm? So we'd like to study things like that and the, this is an important chapter. The study of these things is an important chapter in what's called probab uh, probabilistic number theory. So it's another offshoot of analytic number theory. Let me give a, an example of a completely additive function. What's called the Louisville function, omega of n, is the number of prime powers, prime, prime divisors counted with multiplicity or prime, prime um, divisors counted with multiplicity. Well, what I mean here is if n is equal to p1 to the alpha 1, pk to the alpha k, then omega of n is going to be equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha k. Okay, so that's the counted with multiplicity. I'm going to count. Before, we only counted 1 plus 1 plus 1 for this omega of n. But now this capital omega of n will be, I'm counting it with multiplicity. So I plug the thing in, okay? So this is a completely uh, multiplicative function, a uh, completely additive function, sorry. Completely additive, okay? So this is completely additive. It's clear because it doesn't, it's counting the multiplicity. Now it's okay, right? Completely additive. And again, one could ask questions about the behavior of this function and how does these sums and moments behave. And that takes you again into another chapter of probabilistic number theory. So I'm asking all these questions about the behavior of these things. And so it might be interesting to come up with some technique as to how to approach all those, such questions. But before I do that, I should give you one more example.
<coughs> Give you one more example. Uh, I guess it's number five. This example is called the von Mangold function. The, after the person who discovered it, um, very useful notation, I suppose. This function is defined as follows lambda of n is equal to log p if n is a prime power, p to the alpha, p prime, and it's 0 otherwise. Okay, so this function is, in some sense, it detects prime powers. Hmm? And every time it's a prime power, it will only pick up the prime, though. It won't pick up the power. Hmm? And <coughs> here's the interesting thing about lambda of n. Uh, it is, firstly, is it a multiplicative function? No. Is it an additive function? No. Right, it's neither multiplicative nor additive. However, it's going to be an important function in, in number theory, so we'll look at it. So there are functions which are neither this nor that, which are nevertheless important, and we should, we should study them too. Okay, now, the interesting thing is we notice that Every number can be written as a product of prime powers uniquely, unique factorization. So log of n is equal to alpha 1 log p1 alpha k log pk. So that's obvious, right? I just took logs. But now I can rewrite this very neatly as a summation over the divisors of n lambda of d. Because this guy is going to be 0 unless d is a prime power. And whenever d is a prime power, it's going to spit out log p. But it'll spit out log p how many times? As many times as alpha 1 times. So this is the how it's, but writing log n in this fashion <coughs> is like uh, it's 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 tantamount to like um, uh, writing a function as a Fourier transform or something like that. So this is some you're writing log n as summation d divides n of some function. So if you think in terms of some integration, this analogous to some integration and some function, this is um, some sort of transform of log n. And this, might, this point of view will be useful in, try, in, in general in trying to understand asymptotics of summatory functions, okay, as we'll see in a second. Uh, are there any questions so far? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So you got so the whole chapter one is um, about arithmetic functions. Hmm? So I, I, I gave you a very quick introduction to chapter one, and you can study a little bit more in detail. At your own rate, at your own speed. <coughs> Okay, so uh, so that's a summary of arithmetical functions. Uh, let me say a few words about um, what are called summation techniques. Hmm? And um, the most important um, technique is what's called the method of partial summation. <coughs> sometimes called Abel summation after Abel who discovered it. OK, 
Okay, so this basically it says let uh, let a sub n <coughs> be a sequence of be a sequence of numbers. complex numbers and <coughs> f of t a differentiable function on um, you know for for t bigger than equal to a t bigger than zero say <coughs> doesn't it doesn't you can restrict and relax these conditions but it's not um, terribly important set a of x to be the partial sums of a sub n then <coughs> the sum n less than x a sub n f of n is equal to a of x f of x minus the integral from 1 to x a of t f prime of t dt. So this is the first tool I am putting into your hands for the purpose of studying an uh, analytic number theory. So the, what is the tool? The tool is it's telling you how to change a sum into an integral. That's the amazing thing. And the, you know integration is very easy. You've got lots of methods, calculus and so on and so forth. So this is the first powerful um, tool that you have available. As long as you know something about the behavior of the partial sums, summation a n, you can change a sum like this into an integral. <coughs> And you will see in a second how powerful this idea is. In fact, it more or less animates all of analytic number theory. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let's try and prove this. Proof is not terribly hard. So um, notice that a sub n is a of capital N minus a of capital N minus 1, right? I mean, you sum a1 to a n minus a1 to a n minus 1. Okay, so it's clear. So what we do is we will take this sum and replace a n by a of capital A of n minus capital A of n. This is, this is Abel's proof, okay? So, I mean, he didn't write it like this. Uh, I'll tell you his motivation later on, uh, but that's, this is his starting point. So he starts out like this, a of n minus a of n minus 1. <coughs> And now you do what you think you do. You um, <coughs> you just write it like this. Hmm? Fair enough. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change variables here. And I'm going to let, so as n is running up to x, n minus 1 will run up to x minus 1. So I'll just change n minus 1 to n again. And this will be f of n plus 1. And then I'm moving only up to x minus 1. Hmm? And now that I have that, I combine, this sum is going up to x, this sum is going up to x minus 1. So I, um, <coughs> now there's a small issue about x being an integer or not. So let's just assume for a moment that x is a natural number, okay? So maybe I should have said first suppose that 
x is a natural number <coughs> so that we don't need to worry about these small idiosyncrasies. Okay, so this sum is going up to x and this sum is going up to x minus 1. The new term here is the x term. And then I can combine both of these sums going up to x minus 1. like so. Okay? Then I write this as the integral from n to n plus 1 of f prime of t dt. Well, there's a, oh, sorry, here's a minus. So here, yeah, it's a minus. No, that's a plus. Okay, so this is a minus. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so it's a minus. That's right. <coughs> okay? Now, Make, making the observation that in the interval n to n plus 1, a of n is actually the same as a of t, hmm, for t except at the end points. But you know in the Riemann integral, if, if I fudge the end points, it doesn't really matter. So this whole thing then can be rewritten as a of x, f of x, minus the integral. Well, the sub, these integrals are going from n to n plus 1, and n is going up to 1 to x minus 1. So the whole thing is going up to 1 to x, and here I have a of t, f prime of t dt. Everybody okay with this proof? And now you can, I leave it as a small exercise for you to figure out that when x is not a natural number, this is still valid. You just have to do a small one more line of calculation, okay? So this is still valid, still valid. if x is not a natural number. <clears throat> so you get the, this is the proof. So the proof of this changing a sum into an integral is a very, very important tool in analytic number theory. In fact, it, I would say it animates a good chunk of it. Hmm? So having this in hand, we are now um, in a very good position to answer some of the questions I was asking about what is the behavior of those sum of arithmetical functions, things like that. So let's try and see what we can do with it. Is it okay? Now I'll rub out this proof here. So let's look at a few examples. Let's look at, for example, um, the following question, summation n less than x, 1 over n. What is the asymptotic behavior of this function? Let's look at that. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> I want to apply this lemma, or this partial summation lemma. And this is what I'm saying. You know, in, in mathematics, not just number theory alone, mathematics in general, and probably in science as a whole, um, what you have to learn is you have to learn how to use the tools. Hmm? And if you just know one tool and you really know how to use it, you can probably make a career out of it. Okay, so this is one tool. If you know how to use it, you can probably make a career. I'm no joking, you know. So um, that way you look at this thing and you now try and figure out, I want to find the asymptotic behavior of that. I want to use this and change it into an integration. Hmm? So this is telling you somehow, what am I going to pick for a sub n? What am I going to pick for f of n? Okay. And if you pick a sub n to be 1 over n, you will need some information on part. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. So why would you pick, pick that, right? So you should pick a sub n to be something you already know. So probably I should pick a sub n to be 1 and f of n to be 1 over n. 
So in, in trying to do this, pick a sub n to be 1 and f of, f of t to be 1 over t in Abel's lemma. Okay. <clears throat> then what happens? Summation n less than x, 1 over n, is, well, first thing, what is a of x? a of x is n less than x, 1, right, in this case. So that's just the greatest integer function, right? Everybody knows about this greatest integer function, right? So this is a of x, which is the greatest integer of x, times f of x, which is 1 over x, minus the integral from 1 to x, a of x, a of t, which is greatest integer of t, times the derivative of 1 over t, which is minus 1 over t squared, right? So this becomes plus t squared dt. So this is an interesting theorem in itself. It tells me that summation, what I was interested in, all of a sudden got changed to integrals. Now, the greatest integer function x and the number x differ by at most 1. Okay? So um, <clears throat> let me, uh, this is a good time to introduce a notation also. So let me just do that. This is an important notation in, in mathematics, uh, the big O notation. We say uh, a function f of x is big O of g of x if there exists a constant kappa, okay, such that f of x is bounded by k times g of x. Usually g of x is positive anyway, okay, but we'll, we'll keep it like this, for all x, uh, as x tends to infinity, for all, for all x uh, sufficiently large, or for all x. Good notation to have. It's a very nice notation. It might look like, well, you know, you don't need this notation. You can keep inequalities, but you know, Sometimes in, actually all the time in mathematics, notation can be everything. For example, the idea of zero as a symbol of nothing is a very profound notation. And that changed the world, right? Created the decimal system, changed the world. So notation, it can be everything. So here, I'm going to introduce this big O notation. Um, and this notation is going to help in not worrying about inequalities. So that way I'm going to write x, the greatest integer function x, as essentially I'd like to think of it as pretty close to x, but the difference is it's bounded by 1. So big O of 1 means it's actually bounded, right? Big O of 1, that's the notation, okay? So x plus something bounded by 1. All right, so if I write that for this greatest integer x here, then that's x plus something O of 1. So now we can rewrite this as summation n less than x, 1 over n equals, well, the numerator is now x plus O of 1 divided by x hmm, plus the integral is now 1 to x, t plus O of 1 divided by t squared dt. Hmm? Fair enough. And now x is just 1 there, plus O of 1 divided by x is O of 1 over x. Okay? nice notation, plus integral t over t squared dt, that's just log t, so it's just log x, 
and then integral 1 to x o of 1 dt over t squared. Okay. And so, this is something bounded, this is a convergent integral, so this whole thing is O of 1 bounded. So, in other words, I have shown that summation n less than or equal to x, 1 over n is equal to, this is the main term, but everything else is bounded. Okay, so, I can write that down. So, this, is, this theorem is very nice because it gives me immediately without any difficulty um, asymptotic information without too much work. I just have to know how to use this Opel lemma. So, thus <coughs> summation n less than x 1 over n is log x plus O of 1. Okay. Now, if you look at this proof, you can actually do better than this uh, because you wasted a few things. So, we go back and check what it is that we wasted. Now, I wrote my um, function greatest integer x as x plus O of 1. What I am going to do now is I am going to write this as x minus what is called the fractional part of x. So, this is my notation. This is the definition um, x minus greater than 0 of x. Okay? So, this is what is called the fractional part of x. So, in this uh, calculation, we of course, were able to get the asymptotic behavior very quickly. However, uh, if we take a little bit of care and shove this in here, so here now we will say x minus fractional part of x. t minus fractional part of t. And then let us just do this calculation one more time. Hmm? Then what happens? Well, the first one is 1. The second one is fractional part of x divided by x, but that is still plus O of 1 over x. So, there was no problem there in the previous, uh, it matches the previous calculation. But this time, this is t over t squared, that is still in log x. But this time, I get 1 to x of fractional part of t divided by t squared dt as a term. In, and before, I just sloppily put O of 1 there and said this whole thing is bounded. But now, you can see that this is actually a convergent integral. So, I am going to rewrite this. Well, I am hoping you memorize this now. So, keep this here. Um, so, notice that so a little with a little bit more care with some care we see summation n less than x 1 over n is equal to <coughs> what is it I can't see on the board okay 1 plus o of 1 over x plus log x minus the integral 1 to x fractional part of t dt over t squared. Okay. And then I am going to write this guy here as equal to the integral from 1 to infinity fractional part of t dt over t squared and subtract what I added from x to infinity fractional part. The advantage of doing that is this is a number now. It does not depend on x anymore. Okay, so, this is some sort of constant, c call it. And now, this guy here 
is an integral which goes from x to infinity, but the numerator is bounded by 1. The denominator is t, t squared, therefore I can just bound it by the integral from x to infinity dt over t squared, which is 1 over x, right? So this is all 1 over x. Therefore, this compares with this error term here. And so the final result here is that you get log x plus 1 minus some constant plus O of 1 over x. Now, you may ask me, well, I've got an O of 1 over x here, and I have an O of 1 over x here. Isn't it 2 times O of 1 over x? And the answer is, of course it is. But you don't care because this O means up to constant. So it doesn't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to put it twice. That's a convenient notation. Again, it's notation. Okay. So this is better than before. This number here is often denoted gamma, and it's called Euler's constant. back to your work. Hmm? So what we have now is using Abel's summation method, <coughs> we actually have a very interesting theorem that the behavior of this function is log x plus a constant plus something that goes to inf zero very fast, which is a very good theorem. Hmm? You'll see that it's very useful to have this particular theorem. <coughs> OK. This is first example. Let's do another example. Um, determine the asymptotic behavior of summation n less than x log m. <coughs> okay, so again, but for the uh, Abel. Lemma, you know, we want to try and see what to pick as what a n is what, what is f of n, so on and so forth. Well, again, we will pick up a sub n to be 1 and f of t to be log t. Fair enough? Hmm? Then apply Abel. Sometimes, you know, in the literature, People just say, by partial summation, that's what they're doing. They're applying this lemma, but then you have to figure out what was a sub n, what was the function, because they won't tell you. It should be, uh, this is when you fee read that phrase in the literature, that's what you have to check. So now we, we know how to do these things. You just go log n. So a of x is greatest integer of x, log x minus the integral, 1, 2, x, greatest integer of t, times the derivative of log t, which is 1 over t, right? t. Okay. So this time we're going to do the same trick as we did before. Greatest integer of x is equal to x plus o of 1. Something bounded. So if I do that, what do I get? I get x plus O of 1 log x minus the integral 1 to 1 to x t plus O of 1 dt over t squared. <coughs> okay? So this time you're going to get x log x. Pardon me? What do I have? T. Oh, just t. Sorry, yeah, not t squared. Sorry. Yeah, 
Correct, thank you. <coughs> so x log x plus O of log x, right? Minus the integral of, well, t over t is just 1, and the integral of 1 is x minus 1, right? And then um, I have an integral big O of 1 dt by t, which is big O of log x. Okay. Now keep in mind that so what I have is here x log x minus x plus one plus o of log x plus another o of log x plus that's o of log x again. And log x is bigger than one, and so this term is irrelevant now. See how this old business works? There's no point keeping that silly one there because that silly one is bounded by log x. I mean, it doesn't make any sense for you to have carried it anyway, so you have this plus O of log x. So you have a nice formula again here, which I will write here as summation n less than x log n is x log x minus x plus O of log x. And you may ask, hey, maybe you could do better like we did there. Hmm? And the answer is yes, you can. And that's called the euler maclaurin sum formula. You kind of, kind of keep on re refining the thing a little bit more and more. And you can do better than that. But for the, for the purpose of this initiation into analytic number theory, maybe this is good enough. Hmm? Any questions so far on this stuff? OK. Now, these might look boring to you, but uh, believe it or not, uh, these are actually um, quite important results in um, number theory. And uh, it has to, we have to credit the genius of Chebyshev, who recognized that these simple, <laughs> silly <laughs> results can give you information about the distribution of prime numbers. So let me say a few words about that now. Hmm? Um, <coughs> practically all of number theory is preoccupied with the distribution of prime numbers. Prime numbers, as you know, are the building blocks of all natural numbers. And just as physicists stu study the atomic structure uh, of nature, because the, the atoms, protons, neutrons, and so on and so forth, are the building blocks of all of nature. Similarly, prime numbers are the building blocks of all of mathematics. So if we want to study mathematics, it makes perfectly good sense to be studying prime numbers because they're the building blocks of all the numbers. And in order to understand prime numbers, we'd like to ask various questions about them. That's why number theory is, is <coughs> preoccupied with that. So. Uh, one of the first uh, questions about prime numbers is um, <coughs> is um, how are they distributed? <coughs> so let let pi of x be the number of primes less than x. <coughs> Now, I think most of you know that there are infinitely many primes. You know this usual Euclidean proof. You, if there were only finitely many, you multiply them all together, add one, and then it can't be a, um, you know, it has to be divisible by one of the primes that you started with, but it can't be because it means it divides one and there's a contradiction, right? This is the proof that goes back to Euclid. Um, okay, in a second, I'll give you another proof of that. And then you may ask me, why do you give another proof of that? Well, it's because, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's not results per se that we're interested. We're interested in methods. So if you give me a new proof of something else, that's very valuable because that means you've stumbled on a new method. That's why these are important. Okay, so we now look at pi of x, the number of primes up to x. And I believe it was Gauss who first conjectured that pi of x is essentially asymptotic to x over log x. I mean, he made a, f a more precise conjecture, but I don't want to 
talk about that now. But so this was the conjecture that Gauss made, apparently as a teenager. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, this is what uh, the story is. <clears throat> the question is whether or not um, we can prove this. So this is a conjecture of Gauss. And um, Chebyshev, in the 1850s, I think, I might be wrong on the dates, but roughly around that time, uh, showed that there exist constants A and B positive such that <coughs> such that pi of x is less than bx over log x and is bigger than ax over log x. So at least it grows like that. Whether, you know, whether or not we can prove a of x is asymptotic to that is another question, but it grows like this. And he also, he, he struggled very hard to prove this. Mm. He kept getting better and better numbers. There's these numbers, he started making them closer and closer to 1. And then he proved the remarkable theorem, if the limit exists, oops, x over log x, if this limit exists, then the limit is 1. So he managed to show that the, the key idea or the key part of the problem is to show the existence of the limit. And all of these two results, both of these results, he proved using nothing more than Abel's lemma. Okay, so it's probably a good idea to show you that and maybe stop for today and then continue on Friday. Hmm? So how does this work? How do you <coughs> how do you do that? Well, the, the secret is here. The secret is here, apparently. Um, so go, let's go back. Let's recall the von Mangold function. Let's recall that. Hmm? Remember lambda d again? Lambda d spits out log p whenever d is a prime power and 0 otherwise, right? So, so we know that. So this is somehow, a, not quite, but somehow like a characteristic function of prime powers, hmm? except it's weighting the prime with the log p. Hmm? It's a weighted func characteristic function. So on one hand, we know some n less than x log n from this. know that. On the other hand, <coughs> we know that log n is this. Therefore, we put that in here. This equals summation n less than x summation d divides n lambda d. Put it in there. And now we interchange summation. Natural thing to do in, in mathematics when you have two, two sums, right? If they're absolutely convergent, you can interchange. So d is dividing n and n is less than x, therefore d is less than x.
And inside, I'm counting n less than x, d divides n, 1. Right? That is, how many numbers are there less than x which are divisible by d? Well, they have to look like d times t. And d times t has to be less than x. So t has to be less than x over d. Therefore, this number is nothing but the greatest integer of x over d. Right? Therefore, this is equal to summation d less than x, lambda d, x over d. So you have this very remarkable connection between the two now. Something, we're getting very close to some information about primes here, okay? Now, you'd like to do the obvious of removing the square brackets. like to do that. <clears throat> and so, so actually at this point, Chebyshev got a bit stuck. He knew, he knew that this identity, on one hand you have this silly thing coming from just calculus, and on the other hand you have this connection to number theory, and somehow you should be able to get some information on primes from this identity. It's too good to be true. Therefore, you have to be able to get some more information from this thing. So um, the problem is, of course, he needed some information on need a bound for this function, what he calls psi of x, which is just d less than x lambda d. <coughs> so this is his definition of psi of x. It's just the partial sums of the lambda d's. If I can, so he wants to know how to prove how, how, to, how this grows, okay? So let me just say a few words about that and what he did in order to talk about this. So it's, it's actually, you know, when you have a good idea uh, and it works at least a little bit and then you get stuck, it's probably worth the effort to push it forward a little bit because it was a good idea. So now um, we have here, uh, we suspect that if the number of primes or number of prime powers in general is about O x over log x and we are weighting each prime by log of d, most likely this is like O of x, perhaps. <clears throat> Perhaps this is the case. Let us suppose so. For a moment, I'll come back to it in a second. And if that's the case, then it allows me to handle this error term. Then summation d less than x x lambda d over d um, plus o of x equals this guy, x log x plus, uh, sorry, minus x plus o of log x. So we get an equality, okay? And now what would you like to do? We would like to divide the whole mess by x. So if I divide this by x, I get O of 1. This by x, I get log x. This by x, I get minus 1. But minus 1 is O of 1. You've already, you haven't told me what that thing is, so what's the point of carrying the minus 1 there, right? It's O of 1 and then divide by x, that's log x over x, but log x over x goes to 0, 
O of 1 is the larger error term, so you just put O of 1. Okay, so you end up getting this remarkable result. Okay, from that. So the only question is, what about this? Because I assumed this in order to get here. And let's see what Chebyshev, how he did that. The very clever idea. So Chebyshev, in the early days of this whole question recognized that psi of x, which is d less than x lambda d, is an important function to study instead of the prime counting function. Pi of x is more natural. than pi of x, which is the prime counting function. And I'm, I'm going to leave these as exercises now using Abel's lemma. Oh, one more thing before I do this. And he also defined theta of x, which is just the primes less than x, log p. Okay? So what's the difference between theta of x and psi of x? Well, when p is a prime, you're going to, this is going to spit out log p. So that's it, theta of x is in there. So clearly, clearly, theta of x is less than or equal to psi of x. All the primes are in there. But on the other hand, <coughs> what's the difference between the two? Well, it's going to, this is also counting prime powers. So it's counting squares of primes, cubes of primes, and so on and so forth. And how many squares of primes are there up to x, at most root x? And what's the contribution of each of those things, at most root x log x? How many cubes are there at most x? x to the one-third. And what is it going to contribute? Log x. So it's x to the one-third log x. So you just keep on counting how many powers there could possibly be. And it isn't very difficult to show that um, psi of x and theta of x are pretty close to each other, and they only differ by something like that. Okay, so it's a small exercise for you to do. So psi of x and theta of x are very close together, and the error term is x to the half log x, because those are the prime powers, prime powers, cubes, and so on and so forth, right? Hmm? Okay, so you get that. Um, so what um, Chebyshev proved was um, pi of x being asymptotic to x over log x is completely equivalent to theta of x being asymptotic to x, which is completely equivalent to psi of x being asymptotic to x. And this, these, this, these assertions are all exercises in Abel's lemma. You just have to see how we put it together. It's, it's very straightforward. So exercises in Abel's lemma. So that same old lemma <coughs> that he used. <coughs> so if I want to prove this, it suffices to prove this, or it suffices to prove this. So this is what he was after hmm? once he got that. Now um, let's go back and see how he actually proved this. <clears throat> well, um, it's a very brilliant idea. He made the following observation. If I look at the binomial coefficient 2n choose n, this binomial coefficient, you can see that if I take the binomial expansion of 1 plus 1 to the power 2n, this is one of the terms in the expansion. Therefore, it's clear that this is less than 2 to the 2n. Okay, so you get this inequality. And what is so great about this particular middle binomial coefficient? Well, 
it is divisible by all the primes that lie between n and 2n. Because all the primes that lie between n and 2n appear in the numerator, but they're not canceled by the thing in the denominator. Clever, huh? So this is the kind of this is the kind of um, observational skills that you must acquire in if you want to call yourself a scientist or a mathematician, right? You have to kind of make these. Everybody just looks at these things and just says, "Yeah, it's interesting." And moves on, but. The, the real scientist will say, no, hold on, this, of course it's obvious, but there's something interesting going on. To see something interesting going on in the obvious is what we have to cultivate. Okay? So here we have all the primes between n and 2n as divisors of this thing. And therefore, if I take logs, so this number is less than this number. So I take logs summation log p between n and 2n, okay, this strict inequality, is less than 2n log 2. Just take logs. Whatever, this binomial coefficient is less than 2 to the 2n. This is a divisor that, of that binomial coefficient. Therefore, this number has to be less than this. Take logs and you get this. And in, this, in his notation with this <coughs> theta thing, so this says theta 2n minus theta n is less than 2n log 2. Iterate this one more time. Theta n minus theta n over 2 is less than n log 2. <coughs> and then keep on going. Add them up, they cancel. It's a kind of telescoping sum. And so, lo and behold, you'll get theta 2n is less than 4n log 2. In other words, uh, he's managed to show that theta of x is O of x. <coughs> Okay, theta of x is O of x. So using that, he says, well, psi of x and theta of x don't differ by very much. They differ by root x. Therefore, root x is much smaller than x. So if I've got theta of x is O of x, so is psi of x O of x. Because x to the half is much smaller than x. Okay, so this is now done. Okay? Now, if you have this, you can see that... Um, this first half of the inequality comes through. <clears throat> so, having Well, theta of x is O of x means this, right? For some, it's that. So, in other words, <coughs> and I can split this up into into um, p less than root x log p and p bigger than root x log p and recognize that this guy is O of root x log x and then this guy is now pi, uh, so uh, summation log p root x p x is bounded by k x plus o of x to the half log x. 
And now here we have a, a lower bound. Uh, so this, each of these terms here is at least log of root x. So 1 half log x times the number of primes from x, number of primes up to root x is bounded by kx plus o of x to the half log x. Okay. And now keeping in mind that pi of root x is the number of primes up to root x and that it's O of root x, that's a stupid estimate, but let's put it in any way. You see that pi of x now is less than some other constant b x over log x. I hope this is all clear. You can see the power of the O method. The big O symbol is very convenient and you don't get bogged down by trying to keep track of constants when it's not necessary. Of course, sometimes it might be necessary, but in this case it's not. It's, it's to your advantage. So essentially this is irrelevant. So you get pi of x log x times a half is bounded by some kx. This is also smaller than this, therefore it's uh, okay. So therefore pi of x is less than bx over log x. So he manages to prove <coughs> the first estimate in this fashion using only that little trick with the binomial coefficient. Okay? And then the other part <coughs> is done using this. With the other part for the lower bound we have the following. So you have summation log p over p, p less than x. So from here, I want to go to only primes. There are prime powers also here, but the prime power contribution is very small compared to, uh, in fact, the prime power contribution, by the way, is a convergent series. Because every time, see, when d is a prime, it's a log p over p. But d is a prime power, it's going to be p squared, p cubed, so, so forth. But summation log p over p squared converges log p over p cubed convergence. So all that stuff is a convergent series. So it isn't difficult to see that this from star we have this equality or asymptotic. And therefore if I, this, what is this O of 1? It's a certain constant, isn't it? This, this, this thing. So if I pick, choose um, some delta sufficiently small so that, or if you like actually, it's, it's, this is the way you do it, um, choose A sufficiently large, choose A large so that <coughs> If I take x over a so up to x it's log x plus o of 1 up to x over a it's log of x over a plus o of 1 take the difference plus o of 1 right so what have I done Keep in mind that this O of 1 is a fixed quantity here. I'm going to choose my A really gargantuan so that this is bigger than that thing. So that I can say it's bigger than some constant C0. So the sum here in between these two intervals is bigger than some C0 here. And then what do I say? I say that the, this is a decreasing sequence. The largest term is really at, the, at this lower end. So the, and, and the, and the uh, sorry, the, the smallest term, um, <coughs> yeah, the larger term is at, is, 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 is at the other end. So now you can see that um, <coughs> log of x over a divided by x over a times the number of primes between x minus x over a 
is bigger than some constant C0. And so from here, you can see that pi of x minus pi of x over a is bigger than a constant x over a divided by log x over a. And therefore, since this is a lower bound for the number of primes up to x, you end up getting the lower bound there. Okay, so you end up getting the Chebyshev theorems by just using <laughs> two ingredients. One is Abel's lemma, and the other is that binomial coefficient trick, but putting all of these things very cleverly together. Okay, so I think this is enough for the first day, um, especially I think it's quite a bit of stuff. Uh, gives you an introduction of how to use the thing. So make, next time we meet, which is Friday, I guess, I will try to uh, give you more um, details uh, and how to use these techniques and uh, understand more about prime numbers and other functions. Hmm? Are there any questions or anything like that you would ask? Hmm? OK. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always ask them privately to me um, or bring them along for next time.